Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you day 237 with Alexei Rostovich, Lieutenant Colonel Advisor to the Office of the President of Ukraine, and Mark Fagan, Russian Opposition Politician. Today they're going to talk about Iranian drone situation and ways to resolve it, and what is Putin's plan with that, and why will it fail, and also new countries that are recognizing Russia as the state sponsor of terrorism. Well, without further ado, enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live. It is Tuesday, October 18th, 8 minutes past 10. Apologies for delay due to unforeseen circumstances. Sorry. Over 180,000 are watching us live. 52,000 of you clicked the like button. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. It is day 237 with Alexei Rostovich. Glad to see you, Alexei. Yes, uh, hello everybody. We have a ton of news to discuss. Before we go there, uh, once again, please uh, share links to that stream in your social media, in your Reddits, other forums, wherever you use it. And uh, we have quite a few news to address. Okay, uh, of course, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alex Aristovich. Fagin Live is approaching 1.9 hundred thousand millions and Alexei has almost the same amount. If you are watching or listening that in English, subscribe to Privateer Station. We are storming a more modest 20,000 viewers. All right, let's start with situation on the front. Can we see the map in the studio? Let's see if I can see it. Okay. Let's start with the east, left bank of Askol River. So General Command announced that we heroically defended counter-offensive from Belgorod region on the north of Kharkov territory. Why are they doing that? Uh, why are they attacking us on the border? They're creating a threat on the border, so we would stay on the tiptoes and don't throw everything towards Slatova. Where did it happen? Um, somewhere near Arekhova on the map. I cannot find it here. I thought I have it open in my map. Hang on, let me look at the general command page. Yeah, I don't see any Arekhova here. Oh well, can't really pick it up that fast. Uh, it was something starting with an O. But the logic is uh, the same. They're creating the cutoff flank to make sure we are concerned about our flank and do not uh, withdraw or move most of our troops from the border towards Svatova. Svatova, they're still active. They're trying to counterattack, trying to sense uh, our defense lines. And it is right here, almost in the middle of the map, that uh, somewhat bigger town. And who's fighting there? This is a mix. This is a potpourri of uh, remaining regular troops, uh, lavishly sprinkled with uh, mobilized. So what's their goal? What are they trying to do there? Uh, hard to tell. They're just, uh, you know, sort of fighting. Are they fighting well? It is kind of difficult to tell. I would say, you know, there is a saying that God is on the side of big battalions. Um, because if big battalion has a core, um, they actually, even if, you know, it grows, if the core is sound, they will be a relatively manageable and relatively okay military detachment. Uh, if the commanders are also mobilized, then it's a whole other story. Also near Belagorovka, they try to do a few counterattacks, and my friends were telling me very similar stories what I was talking about, Bakhmut. Uh, happy cheerful attacks by mobilized, uh, led by a few cadres, where they lose 50, retreat, restock a little, send another, lose more 50. So are these uh, inmates, or who's fighting there? It's a mix. Uh, definitely half of them are inmates. But the logic of the Russian army is basically 
to make sure that your soldier is afraid of your own corporal or of, of uh, your own uh, officers more than uh, they're afraid of the enemy. So when they're afraid more of those who are behind them, they go forward and they try to achieve certain objectives. And that's what they're trying to do here. We keep shooting them and they keep falling back. Now the same thing, situation is near Bakhmut. Our 93rd Brigade is uh, showing wonders of uh, the art of warfare. This was one of our strongest brigades, uh, mechanized infantry, and they're really tough. But right now they're showing wonders of battle efficiency. Uh, they're mowing down more than a hundred of uh, these attackers daily. And uh, they also got some respite, they got a bit of help, so we'll be able to stabilize situation there back to the norm. Um, if we go a little further south, where you see right in the middle of the map, there's a uh, indentation in their defense near Tradovka, and they, they are keeping the same thing, keeping attempts to attack it. If we go south near Avdiivka, they are trying to move to the north. You see that arrow going up. And they're still trying the favorite Russian style of attack, uh, of war fighting. Let's go up, let's go fight. Uh, oh, they killed us. Well, let's get more people and try the same thing over and over again. Uh, Zaporozhye uh, artillery fights and occasional jets joining the fray in uh, Kherson. The means of the battalion commander are use, are being heavily used. So a lot of artillery, a lot of HIMARS, uh, a lot of jets. We are destroying their warehouses and we also hit a lot of uh, new mobilized people who are being thrown there. They're deploying them in big groups without cover, 200, 500 people and um, they're losing a lot. They're losing a lot of uh, personnel there, even Suravikin addressed that. And uh, he mentioned that he cannot exclude uh, very difficult decisions, which I guess might include uh, leaving Kherson. Well, yeah, if he brought 2,500 uh, mobilized and half of them are gone in just one day, yeah, there'll be some very uneasy decisions to be made. Okay, then there is a different question to address. All these attacks with drones from Crimea that fly a thousand miles, does it affect the front line at all? Um, no, it doesn't affect the front line because they're using it on the front initially very minimally to test. Um, they're using it on the civilian infrastructure. It's a very different situation when it's uh, noisily flying over a city, it doesn't matter where, where it hits, it still is a, a terrorism, it still scares people, it might destroy some infrastructure. It is more difficult uh, to use it on the front. When it, you try to aim at something on the front line, you are attacking people who got machine guns, who got different means to shoot down the drone, and you also need to be very precise because people are in camo, they're hidden, you cannot easily see their positions. It's a whole other story when you use these uh, tools against uh, women, children, elderly who cannot really defend them. Today was a quieter day, but they still were sending, I think it actually was missile day today. Um, drones were yesterday, I think they changed them, interchange them daily. Um, so they hit uh, mostly power plants, right? Yeah, mostly power plants and water heating systems. Um, so their goal is to create panic again so that we start, our population will start panicking, moving, leaving the country. It creates a crisis of management, a crisis of possible mobilization, because uh, there may be an eventuality when we need to draft more people. It's a very remote perspective, but, but uh, it does exist in theory. And they're also trying to shake that as well. They're trying to get us back to the situation of the beginning of war, when a lot of people panicked, when uh, clogged some of the roads, disorganized uh, certain elements of civilian infrastructure. And for that, they're trying to disrupt water supply, energy supply, heated water supply. 
And in that time, they're trying to, in the meantime, they're trying to aggregate more mobilized on the front. 100,000, maybe even 200,000 on the front uh, to create a more protected uh, defense line. And then maybe even try to change the situation and start uh, going to offensive again. Also, what else? Create a threat in the Kiev direction that is uh, related to Suravikin's uh, statement about Kherson. We'll talk about that. I'm 100% sure they're related. And then create new pressure on us and uh, try to pressure us with uh, exceeding numbers on the front if they manage us uh, to push us to waste most of our anti-air defense missiles into something like mopeds, like these Iranian drones, then maybe they may have a little more success with missiles. So they're trying to achieve some visual milestones that they could sell as the victory to demoralize our society, to push on the West again, and uh, to make us sit down at the negotiation table again. And uh, that's what they're that's what they're going for. It appears, and they're using Iranian drones. There is also a possibility that Iran must give them some uh, land-to-land uh, ballistic missiles if they run out of theirs. The other uh, part of that uh, strategy is creating a lot of mobilization resource. So there is that. And also, of course, uh, they can potentially hit Kiev if they are really, really losing um, with all the missiles they have. Um, well, there is a good side to that. The good side is that, that any nuclear threat is being pushed further out until they try all these things. And what they're trying to achieve, they're trying to regain the strategic initiative that uh, left them sometime by the end of summer. And uh, they want to create disorganized, uh, grumpy Ukrainian nation and also freezing Europeans in winter. And here comes Putin on the white horse and saying, well, let's negotiate just four districts of Ukraine, four regions. Uh, what's the big deal? Sit down and talk to me. And now the real good news, he will fail. Their social machine and the level of uh, government management doesn't allow them to realize tasks of this level of complex complexity. They, their usual means is uh, just uh, dumb cruelty. And they are dumb and cruel even, first of all, to their own people. Remember, that's the country who wanted to reach uh, Lvov and La Manche in uh, a few days. And after half a year, they're begging Iran for drones, the sanctioned country for weapons to continue fighting. We can understand that in a grand scheme of things, uh, that's a failure. Events such as uh, big continental warfare cannot be resolved in that manner. This is a simple logic of the second grade at school. You can try to create, try to attack certain, attain certain uh, achievements only if you have a certain degree of sophistication of your society, both technological management, uh, if your leadership is savvy enough. And we are now getting more help um, of the same, you know, to counter these Iranian mopeds with new systems. We already got some support there. So they were running out. It's uh, similar. We had the Russian UAVs. Now it's Iranian UAVs. Uh, it's similar stuff. If uh, Iranian missiles replace Russian missiles, that will not change the situation much. We've seen Russian missiles flying what they'll be now flying ones made in Iran. They cannot achieve strategic goals with that. And when their mobilization effort fails, they don't have another trump card. They tried, that's lit literally what they're trying. They're trying to destroy our infrastructure. And the only thing I see what they can do is once again buy more weapons and do another mobilization. They cannot provide a more complex civilizational answer to these problems because that's the limit of their level of competency as the government, as a society. We know how to do, how to fight that. We already destroyed the cadre military, even without the Western help for the most part. And uh, now that uh, we started getting help from the West since the end of spring, we are doing much better. 
So even if uh, we look in the perspective of that uh, warfare, this is what um, half a percent, 1.5 percent of the world economy fighting with about half of the world economy, 50 percent that are being supported, supportive of Ukraine. For example, right now we uh, started having an issue with drones. We are getting special systems that are fighting drones within a week. So they literally promised uh, to do it on the fly real fast supply. So a week from now we will have these things installed. How do they work? Well, they sh do they shoot them? What, what, what's, how, what's the effect? Well, they interfere with the management, interfere with control of the drone and the drone basically loses uh, orientation and falls. And by the way, if you watched uh, yesterday's videos more accurately, you have seen that uh, in some parts uh, drones were shot down with Zenith artillery already. Everything like in a classic uh, military school, you have lights tracking them in the night sky, you have Zenith artillery shooting them down, and uh, basically for now we are feeling better about uh, closing the window for that menace, and then we get the better systems for the drone warfare, and uh, yeah, they, they lose that chance, they lose that window to use this uh, kind of weapon. Okay, that's that's good news. Um, let's. Uh, there is another piece I want to talk about. There is a conversation planned between your foreign affairs prime minister, uh, foreign affairs minister um, Kuleba, with Israel counterpart. So there is a publication that's. Uh, Sounds very similar to idiot. Well, the proper pronunciation is idiot. Okay. So, Minister of Foreign Affairs will request Israel to supply some anti-air defense systems. And the source that talked to the media doesn't believe that Israel will support that request, despite Israel being supportive of Ukraine in general. So, this is media, so we cannot fully trust that this is the way it will happen, but we'll see. I do hope that Israel finds it within them to actually help Ukraine and support it with that uh, defense system and perhaps influence their leadership. Mark, Israel is in a very difficult situation themselves. I understand that Israel needs to, first of all, think about their own safety and the safety of their citizens. And all negotiations with Israel are usually done, achieve better results if you do them quietly, with coffee, in some European country, without much announcements about that in the media. Well, the situation changed, though. These drones are Iranian. If they were North Koreans, that's one thing. But also drones and missiles, that's a bit of a different term. But it is Russian Federation that is using them, which Israel has a very difficult, uh, complex relations with. And Israel is interested in working with Russia on certain things, and it's interested in developing these relations with Russia more than in destroying relations with Iran. Well. You know, but I think in my in my mind it will last as long as the threat from Iran doesn't uh, include uh, nukes and other things. Even then, Mark, um, I want to say that I don't think they will uh, break the relations with Russia because during the Second Liv uh, Liv Libyan War in 2006, uh, very specific cornet systems were given to Hezbollah that killed and destroyed a, killed a lot of uh, Israelis uh, tankers and destroyed a lot of tanks. And uh, Israel still did not uh, do anything about that, even though Russia supplied these systems. So if Israel is to do something, they likely do it undercover. They, they're not going to announce that. Here I rely mostly on our main allies, our NATO, countries and the countries of G7, they're probably the main resource for us to fight Israel. I understand they need to defend their borders. If they do help, big thanks to them. And we most likely will not even announce uh, the equipment if they send, if they send everything um, that we ask for. So uh, I think it's a principal question though. Uh, can Israel stay on the sidelines in that situation? 
to a big degree, I think it's an illusion. Because Russia is such a confrontation with the world where you cannot really uh, circle your way out of it or wiggle your way out of it. Um, well, Israel is not really wiggling. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, Israel, uh, you know, Medvedev, by the way, in Russia already accused Israel of supporting Ukraine. Well, there we go. There we go. You know, if. Uh, Medvedev ever goes for circumcision, they may chop off a little longer than uh, he wanted to. Uh, I don't think that'll happen with him at this stage in life, but uh, remember the underwear that he was shot in? Uh, yeah, they can do a mean wedgie with it. Uh, yeah, figuratively speaking. Okay, so those who joined us, we already have over 400,000 watching. Please subscribe, share the link. Uh, and if you don't want to subscribe, at least do share the link and subscribe to Alexei Aristovich. Don't even subscribe to Fagin, subscribe to Alexei Aristovich. And of course, if you're watching that in English, subscribe to the privateer station. Okay, let's go back to to the situation. Um, almost none of the Russian generals were public figures. None of them almost were public figures. Surovikin is uh, kind of doing it for the first time, because even Shoigu was uh, as well as public figure as you can make bullet out of shit. Well, there were others. There was Rochlin, there was Kazantsev. Yeah, Rochlin tried, but uh, you know how he finished. Do you think Suravikin is uh, has a different uh, destiny awaiting him? Well, that's funny, right? Um, by the way, uh, Girkin is on the front, he confirmed, so that's another hero. Suravikin, I think, will be grown into a hero, and then at some point it will be disposed of. All right, so he was uh, making media statement. You can watch that uh, if you are concerned to see it in all details. You can find it online, but he's saying that... Population of Kherson region who wants to leave the territory, their military command, Russian military command, is aiding locals to willing to move to Russia. They're aiding them with that program. So okay, they're moving people. He is talking about uh, Kachovska Dam. I and I am adding it from myself that probably Aristovich wants to destroy Kachovska Dam. Do you want to destroy that? Oh, very, very. So, in relation with all that, there could be some difficult decisions made in relation to Kherson. Since we already touched upon the uneasy decisions, I think they're starting to prepare their media that they actually might leave the right bank completely. But, Mark, this will be an attempt to repeat the trickery with Kiev, Chernigov and Sumy withdrawal. Oh, they do want to save some of their cadre. There's a notable amount of uh, cadre military still there. Airborne, uh, mechanized infantry and such. Um, so if they manage to save them from Kherson area, we should be expecting them near Donetsk. If they want to take Donetsk, they'll throw them near Bakhmut. If they want to take Kiev, they'll throw them near Kiev. And they can split them in two and maybe add both, some in Kiev, some in Bakhmut. That will not add uh, much joy to us, because on one hand we'll have uh, liberation of Kherson, on the other hand we'll have threat on the new directions. And um, this is an interesting eventuality. If they decide to do that, that'll be a big victory for us. Uh, if we re take Kherson, if we liberate that part of the region, but on the other hand, what's the difference where you kill them? Um, we'll get rid of them in the north or in the east. If they manage to leave her son. All right, so Surovikin's role. Do you think without Putin's uh, affirmation he would be making these media statements? I think the strategy is simple. They need to grow up the Napoleon-like figure who will be leading them, who can be victorious, where Surovikin is, there is some victory, then he basically solves some of their military issues, then makes a statement about political future, and then they take him out. And then what? The army is demoralized, the army is weak, and the army is not interfering with Putin and FSB. 
Same situation, this is the plan. They've done that with Lebed, with uh, Troshin, with Rochlin. Troshov, though, yeah, yeah, you know, he he's weaker than the other two figures. But he did write the book, My War. Shamanov was another notable figure. Went into politics, but then he realized the threats of it and uh, basically accepted governorship in uh, one of the regions. And then he got caught with... Uh, overspending money, some corruption, and drinking, so, yeah. Okay, in your opinion, do you think all these drone attacks, infrastructure attacks, critical uh, infrastructure attacks, can they be related to Suravikin's command now? I think they were purchased without him. I think they were purchased before he was appointed the head. So, they got about 2,400 of those drones, they used about 300 already. And Suravikin, frankly, he might have used these drones in Syria, and he knows uh, he has some Iranian contacts, and he is uh, definitely preferring to bomb the shit out of everything. He, that's the way he fights. So we can probably throw a shoulder here and some connection between Suravikin, Iran, drones. But frankly, if it even wasn't Suravikin, if you have 2400 drones, you probably will start using them in some capacity. Uh, he may be picking how to, and they're not using them on the front, they're using them on the civilian targets. Um, this decision is political, definitely. I don't think it is a military decision, uh, because the general in the military would not be, let's weaken them up like that. Um, that's too far-reaching. He could have proposed it in one of the, their meetings, their discussions, but I don't know, I think it's more political. Um, all right. Next question. Coming back to the mobilized. Let's comment more on this. Do we understand it correctly that that Belarus direction that is being stocked with 9,000 mobilized troops, in general it's a preparation for in another invasion on the territory of Ukraine? Mark, I think this is a creation of a threat. Will there be an invasion or not? That will depend upon the decision of one person. They're creating the group that might go for that. I think they have, uh, they are very highly tempted to do that. If organizationally they can manage to create a notable group there, they most likely will try to do it. So the goal for them, do you think it'll be the same a second attack on Kiev and maybe captured? No, the goal is the same, to create some hustle around Kiev, to get uh, the picture of field artillery being able to hit and reach Kiev, uh, that some people start fleeing, that the West gets the picture that, see, Russia is near Kiev again, so Russia is strong again, let's discuss, uh, let's maybe talk and negotiate. Russia cannot win in the war in Ukraine. Even if you give them 8,600 of these drones, give them uh, Iranian missiles, they cannot win. They are not capable to win over Ukraine. And they're using all these tools to better their negotiation position. Even if you take that summit in Indonesia, and then uh, all of a sudden Kiev is surrounded again, or there is a threat to Kiev even, um, that uh, start restarts that whole conversation of those Putin's talking heads in the West who start talking that, well, you can never win Russia, we need to sit down and discuss. We'll destroy them, we'll grind them down, they'll retreat again. Do you think they'll be able to accumulate these uh, forces for the third time? No, I don't think so. I think there'll not be a third run for them. So their attempt is not at, and they can't even capture Kiev. So there is nothing else for them to do there. They're working for the picture. There are no other military goals they can pose in front of them. This is all for the show. That makes sense. This is for November. This is for the summit in Bali, when he might be talking to somebody from the West there. If they're making these plans, it doesn't mean that the West will want to talk to them, but they'll try to. 
Right, and they'll do that news injection. Oh, Kiev is again under attack. You gotta go and start talking to us. Using that old word, Goida. Well, you know, we'll take that Goida of theirs, tear it off, tear it off and shove it up all their orifices. Oh, you're a naughty man, and they're talking about me being dirty. Uh, sorry, Mark, I grew up in barracks, so I have a very eloquent vocabulary about certain things. Oh, I shouldn't even mention where did I grow up. Um, normal people probably would not survive there. Um, and big hello to my ex-compatriots from Samara. And, okay, next step. Um, Ukrainian parliament. Rada acknowledged uh, Ichkeria, the Republic of Ichkeria, Chechen Republic. They acknowledge that this is an occupied territory and Ichkeria is an independent state. I had uh, Ahmed Zakayev, official representative of uh, Ichkeria Republic. He is still the formal head of the government in exile. So with that uh, decision made by Ukraine, he becomes the official figure that we will, that Ukraine will be interfe interfering with, uh, interfacing with, talking to. Yeah, he represents the government in exile. Sure, he will be the point of contact for us and anything related to Chechnya. This is our message to all the peoples of Russia. We do consider you and your nations to be enslaved by Russia and Putin's regime. We understand that you have the right to your freedom, to your territory, and to your governance. Chechnya paid twice for their liberty. They spent a lot of people, and they actually won the right to be uh, free. The first war they won over Russia. Um, but um, there are other subjects, like Tatarstan and others, they are independent peoples. They are independent, enslaved peoples, and this is the message we're sending. So, taking that situation uh, right now, do you think other countries may follow Ukraine? Well, for example, Lithuania, they can follow suit and acknowledge uh, Ichkeria? Well, yeah, they, I think these decisions are on the horizon, because today, by the way, in Lithuania acknowledged that Russia is a state sponsor of terrorism. Oh, yeah, I remember them laughing in Russia about visas being banned for Russia. Seriously, look around now, how many visas to Europe can you get if you live in Russia? So, yeah, they are digging themselves in. They started this process that will do them in. And de facto, these uh, enslaved people will get some subjectivity on the world arena. We acknowledge them. Yeah, we acknowledge them. And I understand, we, we acknowledge them, we recognize that they're in a difficult position, that they're being enslaved. And, uh, oh yeah, the Kuril Islands, that... Uh, the first time since the war with Japan, uh, our country, or we as a nation, is, are calling them as uh, contested territories, those Kuril Islands. You know, that's uh, don't trouble trouble until the trouble troubles you, because for 30 years there were no talk about these islands, and now that Russia unleashed all that and the west uh there are issues on the east that we can bring up as well yep i think putin will be the grave master of that empire that he wanted to build that he so cherished and you know the cherry on the whole thing is that russian people never had its own subjectivity and it was not that it ne they never created the subjectivity they never had a chance to create their own Russian subjectivity. They were always part of some empire, some big uh, government agglomeration. There was nothing real Russian about Russia. And even Putin's regime now, that's not a Russian regime, because they're not, it's not represented by uh, Russians as a nation at all. It's mostly Kafkas, Caucasus, and some other regions that are running it. 
Yeah, and then Surovikin will help them to bury themselves deeper. Yep, we've seen a number of these Russians. Okay, so Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia made a few statements. They wanted to probably to follow catch up with Surovikin's uh, media presence. And they're saying that Russia has never threatened with nuclear weapons to Kyiv, has never threatened Kyiv with nukes. And Kyiv for many years has not fulfilled articles of Belovirsky Memorandum. Since at some point I had a Budapest Memorandum, um, I had a diplomatic uh, education, so they were years and years talking about Budapest Memorandum that this does not ac acknowledge it doesn't give the right of it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't give the countries who signed the memorandum the right to unchanging borders so for years they were insisting that this memorandum has nothing in it to address the borders and to keep them in a certain fixed configuration. But right now they are falling back on that memorandum and saying, well, no, if Kiev should, uh, would have followed that memorandum, we would have respected the borders. So how do they think about that? I don't know what, uh, I don't know what they think about this. This is from me. I am a little tired from the statements of Russian Ministry of International Affairs. Um, I think they're dusting this off for whatever reason. They're taking this memorandum and also they're mentioning that they're not threatening Ukraine with nukes. I mean, you think that's related? No, I think they're doing the state nuke statements in regards to the NATO trainings. NATO is exercising a uh, possible scenario of uh, nuclear warfare with Russia and Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs is now stepping up and saying no, 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 we never planned on having a nuclear war because I think at some uh, National Security Council they gathered that uh, and they figured that we probably shouldn't be waving that nuclear stick we can't really weather the fight with NATO and even though they might not be the ones making decision, even though it's Putin who is making such decisions, they're still they they still can make a statement and say that we're not doing the nuke threatening, and um, the West already answered them and said, "Hey, we don't care what kind of nukes you use on the front. If you use even a small nuke on the front, we still consider that you are starting a nuclear warfare." So the West is pr pretty stern still. Well, Russia said we will do similar exercise in Barnes of Sea up in the north. And uh, yeah, I suspect there'll be some boats that will not be able to even leave the ports with their current uh, state of technology. And I'm sincerely afraid that there'll be another Kursk uh, submarine incident. So we'll see. We'll see what happens if they do that exercise. We need to remind the Minister and Russian Fleet and, and Minister of Defense in Russia that during the first day, even if it is a war with the United States, the United States can send 11,000 Tomahawks, conventional weapon, not even a nuclear weapon, that fly real fast and hit real accurate. Can you imagine what the perspective would be if that thing happens? There'll be nothing. There'll be nothing left. There'll be no launch silos, no warehouses. I'm not even talking about that. There will be, yeah, all the command centers will be gone. You can just clear the rubble. I think in general command, they understand that in Russia. They're not, I don't think they're complete idiots. You know, people who are announcing a difficult situations, difficult decisions about Kherson, and then at the same time thinking about fighting with NATO. That's where the root of that Ministry of Foreign Affairs statement lies. Yeah, they've done that trickery before. Before the 9th of May, I think they came out with a similar statement in glasses, who was out there talking that uh, we never, never don't even want to. They're just uh, baseless accusations. Yeah, imagine, uh, Mark, yeah, that's that's the humor of situation. 
giving up here soon and then uh, threatening the world with nuclear war, right? Um, yeah, this is a duality that cannot exist in real world, so... Imagine, imagine if in the Second World War that uh, Americans would be would have Hokkaido and would be withdrawing from Hokkaido because Japanese army would pressing them out and then at the same time uh, they would come out and say we're not using nukes because uh, we we never going to use nukes. It just it doesn't make sense. And they already have no chance uh, to succeed with anything using nukes on the front. And uh, when they are threatened with ret uh, retribution of uh, a system level that we just discussed, it's suicidal. It's just stupid to use these nukes, even tacticals, on the front. Uh, you know, they're not su not exactly suicidal. Uh, remember the Russian roulette game? Yeah, yeah, when they shoot, uh, roll the drum and shoot yourself? Well, there's nothing that simple about that game. When there was a first Smith & Wesson, they, whenever, if you put just one bullet in the drum and roll it, and uh, if you roll it and stand in front of a lady or, you know, a challenger or somebody else, you roll it and you shoot yourself, chances that the bullet will be up and the gun, ready to shoot are nil. The bullet will always be at the bottom. But when uh, the other guns came on the market, the other kind of revolvers, that game faded into obscurity because they did offer a, not a chance that the bullet will be up above and fed into the gun. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting side history. But um, I also did, uh, wanted to touch, before we end for today, there was a statement by uh, Ukrainian uh, Minister of Defense to not shoot the drones with uh, your weapons. Well, uh, yeah, it's a little risky to shoot things uh, in the cities. If you are shooting at something near high-rise buildings, they could be ricochets, could be other unintended uh, consequences. So it should be professionals who are doing that. Uh, amateur shooting of drones in the cities uh, should probably subside because of the risks involved. And we will have new systems, right, that uh, will be capable of protecting Ukraine territory. And by the way, we have Zenith artillery working already. If you watch the videos from Borispol, we shot down 16 drones of 16 incoming. And that was artillery. So yeah, we already figured a few systems. It is much cheaper system. You don't need to waste precious missiles. And uh, now we get the interference stations and it'll be fine. Yeah. All right, we do have a stream on Wednesday, right? Okay. We have a stream and whatever we forgot about today, we'll uh, talk about that tomorrow. We have 536,000 people watching us live. Over 160,000 click the like button. Thank you very much, friends, for doing that and spending the evening of Tuesday with us. Please, uh, once again, subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich, and to the private here station if you are listening or watching that in English. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody. Всем пока.